Ladies and gentlemen, for the thousands in attendance and the millions around the world wishing they were here live with us. Oh, let's get ready to rumble. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you from the bottom of my very tanned heart for participating in a miracle today. I cannot express my, my gratitude and my love for those who have taken time out of their very busy schedules to join us today. And today, folks, before I get overwhelmed with emotion, we have some really special stuff for you guys today. I want to get a big shout out for my main man, Mr. Les Brown. <laughs> Hello, my brother. How are you? It's a plum pleasing pleasure to be in the presence of greatness. <laughs> As they say here in Mexico, muy bendecito, Les. Muy bendecito. Very, very blessed. Un mm, poquito. <laughs> <laughs> Les, we're going to get into a bit more of a deeper conversation about you and I and our, our history together, but I want to ask you a question. What does bet on you mean to you? Well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share this platform with you and also want to just recognize you for the commitment and the stand that you've taken with your life to be a, vo a force for good, to make a difference in people's lives. And, and as we look at our lives right now, in and out of the pandemic, that what's most important right now is that people begin to reflect on who am I? How am I showing up? What do I want to do with my life? What is required in, in terms of who I need to be and the kind of person I need to become in order to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. We're in that place where Einstein once was. He said, the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. So as we go into 2022, now we have to begin to realize there are certain behaviors and choices we've made and 2021 that won't serve us in 2022. So your book, and I'm so glad that you wrote this book, and I'm honored to, to have been able to write the forward for it, it allowed people to take responsibility for their lives and, and teaching them how to turn adversity, disadvantages to their advantage and begin to create a life that they can feel proud of, a life that will outlive them a life that will make a greater impact than what they've done in the past. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself, Les. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know Les, today is a real privilege. And, and Les, just again, I will say this a few more times today. We are so grateful to have you as a part of this wondrous celebration. And I, and I with your permission, would love to share the story of how this book came to fruition because it's, it's a, not just in my humble opinion, it's, it's the opinion of many, many people that have heard this story that's so unbelievably inspiring. And for those who don't know the story, during the, the lockdown of 2020 in May, I had a, a podcast series called Become Your Own Superhero. I had 10 subscribers and, and I got hold of Les's phone number and I called Les and he picked up the phone and I was, I was in my bed on a Saturday morning and for those who know me pretty well know that I don't sleep with any clothes on and, and to my utter shock and surprise, Les picked up the phone and said, hello, Les speaking and I jumped out of bed completely butt naked and I was revealing myself on the 38th story of the apartment complex in Melbourne where we lived and... Uh, and I said, Les Brown. He said, yes, it is. I said, Les Brown, it's Laban Ditchburn from Melbourne, Australia. He said, how can I help you, Laban? I said, Les, I'm the host of an amazing podcast series called Become Your Own Superhero. And, and I'm a huge fan of your work. And I'd love 
to, to share your message with the world, with our audience. When are you available? And he said, when are you thinking, boy? And I said, to be honest, Les, whenever you're available works with me. And we concocted it for the Monday at midnight. I didn't, Les doesn't know this, but I nearly mucked up the time, <laughs> nearly missed the window of opportunity. And when he came on the, the show, I asked Les what he thought of the name of the podcast, Become Your Own Superhero, and, and Les, you just nailed it. You absolutely encapsulated everything I hope people would think when they when they when they heard this this name and and through your vulnerability and your your listening i i felt so endeared to you less that i just verbally diarrheaed my story of transformation to you and and it sort of concluded by saying that you know in on in august th that year 2020 it would have been 4 years since i gave up alcohol and anyone that's read any any of your recent work less will know about your story with addiction and you know a lot of the similarities as well and you said to me something that changed my life forever in that moment. You said, do you have a book, Laban? And I said, no, I don't. I don't. And you, and you said to me, Laban, if you're going to be a speaker, you need a book to help with your credibility. And then you said to me, who was the most influential person in your life when you were five years of age? And that was a tough question for me at the time because despite the many, many challenges that I had experienced, it was my mum. And you said, what attributes did you get from your mother? And made me think about a question that I hadn't asked myself for a very long time. And she was spiritual and she was unconditionally loving and tenacious. And I said to her, said to Les, you know, she always bought organic food. And he's like, yeah, yeah, not that stuff, but like <laughs> attributes. And as I finished saying that, you looked up at me, Les, and you said, Laban, this is a God moment. He said, I'm going to show you how to monetize your passion. And you read back to me the blueprint for this book that you wanted me to write called Bet On You. You created this. This is your name. Mm. And you said, Laban, you're going to write the book. You're going to turn the book into a keynote. You're going to turn the keynote to a three-day retreat. And even if you mark this up, you'll make a couple hundred grand in the next 12 months. And then you said, I'm going to write the forward to your book. Now, if you can imagine, my jaw is on the floor at this point. And in a moment of total insanity, this was mid-May 2020, I said, Les, if you're going to write the forward to my book, I'll have it to you by June 30 of 2020. And in six weeks, I pumped out 30,000 words of the first draft of Bet On You and delivered that to your inbox at 8.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time and changed my life in the process. And so for that, I don't even know how I'll ever be able to repay you, but thank you very much. You don't have to. You have by writing the book and just continuing to show up and being the kind of person that you are. This place where we are is a place where we've never been before. And the experiences that you have gone through, I was reflecting on my life this morning at this place. Here I am, 77, and I was asking myself the question that, what is it that I am supposed to do with all the stuff that's happening in my life right now? And what I realized when I began to reflect on my life, and I'm sure you and, and people that are observing us realize that there are moments in our lives, and many people now reflecting on their lives, that we look back and we realize things that we thought happened to us that they in fact happened for us. And had those experiences not happened, we would not be who we are right now. That we were chosen for times such as this. Hey, Les, you dropped off. We still got interwebs. We still got interwebs. Okay. Let's just uh, bear with us one second, folks. We'll see if we can get Les back. So when we get Les, we'll bring him back on. But 
you're all in for a treat today because I'm going to read you the first chapter of the book to give you a wee taster, a wee taste of what to expect. And we're going to share the link with you to be able to jump on Amazon and get the book and buy a copy for yourself and 10 copies for people that you care about or 100 copies, <laughs> depending on what your budget is. And I've got the, uh, the very first copy here, which just arrived in the mail just the other day, just in time. And the first chapter is called My Two Queens. Is everybody ready? Can I get some love in the chat? Let me know you're there. Yeah. All right. Why don't you take us home and we'll let you do anything you want? She whispered. A puff of warm breath from the tea and want activated the erogenous zone of my lips. The Eastern Bloc accent made me think of Bond girls, but of course. They were physically perfect and smelled like strawberries. Tall, athletic, olive skinned and brunette with super long eyelashes that fluttered in my direction. Hair up, but more than long enough to travel down past their perfect dairy ears. Their red, knee-high Louboutins fitted with sparkling diamantes sent rainbows of light in every direction. I was voluntarily trapped on a huge Chesterfield sofa with two of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. Double and trouble, they called themselves, preferring mystique and anonymity. They were entrepreneurs of the highest order, and I had just been offered the ultimate indecent proposal. And what would my investment be? I asked. My shoulders tensed into my neck with anticipation of their response. $2,000 cash, Trouble said. Anything you want. Remaining cool like an Alaskan winter, I responded with feigned nonchalance. Ladies, ladies, ladies. You've seen what I've spent tonight. I couldn't pay that much if I wanted to. Two pals visiting from overseas Another local friend and I had decided a gentleman's club would be our home for the evening. Like soldiers released on shore leave, we steam trained into that place with blood alcohol levels high enough to blind most amateurs. We needed a quick chemical intervention to level out the intoxication. A chance encounter with a fellow patron provided us exactly what we needed. Sporting a traditional ponytail, buffalo leather vest, and more tassels in Dolly Parton's wardrobe, he looked to be a legitimate Native American. I stood alongside him at the men's urinal and channeled my inner Geronimo. How? I said, using my lowest octave and raising my right hand to show I held no weapon and meant no harm. My left hand remained attached to my own weapon, as urinating on another man's shoes is never cool at the best of times. He was as high as a kite, and he knew that I knew. What do you need? He bellowed in an even deeper voice, his accent confirming my guess. Drugs, please, I inquired. He grinned, zipped up his fly. Within 60 seconds, I'd exchange cash for a fun-sized Ziploc bag of dusty green pills. They had the Mitsubishi logo pressed into them, a.k.a. green Mitsis for all you retired ravers, and looked real enough. It's astonishing the reckless levels of confidence I placed in drug dealers when it came to consuming illicit substances. Mind you, I did the same with the legal stuff, and you'll soon find out how well that turned out. Without further thought, I gulped down two pills, room temperature whiskey, my only lubricant. I shuddered uncomfortably as the alcohol attacked my central nervous system and carried the mystery chemical cocktail down my gullet and into my stomach. 30 minutes later, I was fueled by top-shelf spirits, huge amounts of dopamine, and Christ only knows what else. Sweat poured from my forehead and my face distorted into a lip-chewing, humid, hi humid, human hybrid lizard person, something between a troll and a goblin. A troublin'? My pleasure receptors lit up like the 4th of July and a river of sexual energy cascaded into my loins. If you've ever taken MDMA, you'll empathize. If not, imagine the best orgasm you've ever had. Now fall in love with everybody you meet. Now win the lottery and you're still not even close. And the pleasure extends the entire length of your body and doesn't finish for hours. Sounds awesome, hey? 
The after effects, however, make suicide seem like a real and viable option. And when sober, I craved the feminine touch, but pumped me full of a man-made love drug, and I became hornier than a short-nosed fruit bat. And speaking, <laughs> and speaking of fruit, from the blur of my intoxication, the strawberry-scented double in trouble both appeared. Hello, handsome. Intoxicated by their scent, charm, and seduction, it was less than 60 seconds before I was led down to the dungeon. The special section of the club was designed for you to lose yourself. One lap dance became two, three became four, and four made it the most expensive night I'd ever had. Draining the nearby cash machine, I quickly maxed out my daily limit of $1,000. So that 2000 cash they mentioned? Impossible. My mates didn't have it, nor did I, and even if I did, I couldn't access that much cash. Make it 1600 That's our final offer. Double counted. Done. Give me 30 minutes, ladies. Sure to think, lover boy, they both grinned. I didn't have the 1600 needed, but I had 800 and I knew how to get the rest. The strip club was located half a mile from Crown Casino, Australia's flagship gambling venue. That was my new destination, and I made it in record time. And as the clock struck midnight, a new day reset, and so did my withdrawal limit. I checked my, I checked my bank balance, $800, withdraw. Yes. Like Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, I calmly entered the gaming floor via the escalator, spied the high rollers room and beeline straight to the blackjack table. I definitely, definitely knew what I was doing. Here's a crash course if you've never played blackjack. Each player is dealt two cards individually face up. The dealer is also dealt two cards, one exposed and one hidden. And the value of cards two through 10 is their face value. Jack, queen and king are all worth 10. Aces can be worth 1 or 11. A hand's value is the sum of the card values. The dealer then reveals the hidden card and must draw cards one by one until the cards total up to 17 points. At 17 points or higher, the dealer must stop. Players bet on the basis that they will individually have better hands than the dealer. As I traded my cash for eight $100 chips, nerves forced me to stand rather than sit. The dealer pushed the pile towards me, and I carefully pushed the pile back, resting them perfectly into the felt box. I had just laid the single biggest bet of my life in order to get laid. And that would have been funny if the situation wasn't so tense. All I needed was one result in my favor, and I'd have the resources to fund a hedonistic rampage that would make Hugh Hefner blush. Shit, I was about to engage in every man's fantasy. Were these two willing and beautiful women a gift from a God I didn't yet believe in, but who obviously believed in me? The power I felt placing such a large bet was simply magnificent. Even on such a high limit table, the whites of everyone's eyes added even more light to an already well illuminated room. With the final wages placed, the dealer waved her hand across the table and affirmed, no more bets. As she finished her sentence, the irony of the situation hit. I had already blown $1,000 on the night. Now I was risking $800 to try and win $1,600 to pay for something that, had I just cut to the chase at the very start of the evening, would have saved me all that mucking about. Fuck, I bemused. Why do I make my life so complicated? The game commenced and the blackjack began. Clean, I yelled, violently slapping my hand on the table. That's 10, I counted in my head. The croupier dealt her own cards and delivered a king of spades. Her second card was placed face down, hidden from everyone's view. My heartbeat was already racing from my sprint to the casino complex. Now it had more beats per minute than 90s techno. The second round of cards arrived, and to my utter delight, another queen arrived. Yes! I exclaimed aloud. My yell scared the crap out of the craps table and the mahjong from the mahjongers. The dealer delivered the rest of the cards in silence, and the remaining gamblers surrounding me all went bust. I could feel them silently wishing unimaginable harm to the unsuspecting croupier. But undeterred, she slid her king of spades gently underneath her mystery card and flipped it into the air like an Olympic diver executing a simple rotation. In super slow motion, the dealer's card revealed itself next to the king. 
ice. An ice of fucking spades. Like watching passenger jets plow into the Twin Towers. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The God I didn't believe in had failed me. Blackjack, the dealer reluctantly called out. A collective gasp from the audience broke the silence, simultaneously sucking the air from the room and my lungs. The dealer funneled my losing chips into a small black hole. I wished I could have joined them. My vision blurred and a huge wave of nausea swept over me like a giant vomity blanket. I staggered from the table, my legs suddenly useless. Was it possible to feel any worse than this? Woo! Do we have Waldo Walbert in the house? You do, my friend. Can we get Waldo on screen, Anna? Waldo, good to hear from you, brother. What's going on, my friend? Waldo, huge thank you, huge acknowledgement for joining us today. <clears throat> for those who don't know, Waldo, uh, you need to watch the interview that Waldo and I did uh, uh, on the Become Your Own Superhero show. It's extraordinary. Um, very, very grateful. Uh, Hall of Fame speaker, best-selling author, and just an amazing human being and friend. And Waldo, I just wanted to throw this to you, put you on the spot a little bit, and ask you, what what's your impression of Bet On You? What does Bet On You mean to you? So, as you know, I talk about being a wingman, a trusted partner in life. And a lot of people think that it's all about relationships and collaboration and trust, which is an important part of it. But what I like about you and your message and bet on you is one of the most important wingmen or wingmams there are, and that's yourself. It's the person staring back at you when you put on your uniform, your flight suit, your red sport jacket like you are so eloquently wearing right now and say, do I trust that person staring in front of me? Have I done the hard work? Have I made the sacrifices? Do I really understand what, what, what true trust is? And I think that's what I gather from knowing you, from the premise of your book, and from uh, what I think is important for success in life. You have to trust yourself. You have to be willing to bet on the most important wingman there is, which is you. So uh, that's why I'm on this call, because I, 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 I love your energy. I, I love your passion. Uh, I, I think you're getting is uh, everybody's probably so entertained. I love the opening video. I still want to hear about the milk spills, which just says you have some serious cojones that don't give a crap about what anyone thinks. But uh, uh, you're a great guy, and I, I'm just super thrilled for you. Oh, God, I love you, Waldo. And, and just for the record, I didn't pay Waldo to say those wonderful comments. And and to give you some background on that, that uh, video clip, it was in 2015, and... Um, uh, a friend of mine, Josh Van Kylenberg, wanted me to act in this in this music video for his band, and and the the song, ironically, is called Dopamine. And I talk about this in the book about the you know the the chasing of the dopamine, uh, chasing the the dragon. Except in my case, my dragon was a purebred racing horse, and and uh, that was filmed in a college at, at Melbourne University, and. It only took two takes to to pour the milk over the head, and by the end of the day, I smelt like a I smelt like a horse's ass as well. Um, but uh, it was funny. It was it sort of captured a moment. You know, you'll notice that I was carrying a lot more weight in that video, and they you know the camera adds ten pounds, but not sixty. And and uh, that was really right before the 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 rock bottom moment that I that I write about in chapter two in the book. And, and I sort of bounced on the floor of rock bottom a few times and, and got sick and tired of, uh, of, of that, that experience and wanted to, to take some, some drastic action on that. So uh, it's, it was a, a wonderful moment in time captured on film and very grateful for that. Um, Les, thank you, Waldo. I, I really appreciate that. For those who don't know Waldo, get on and connect. And uh, Waldo, how can, how can people find you? Uh, if you Google Waldo Waldman or find me on LinkedIn, I'll put something in the chat there. Uh, Waldo Waldman, Instagram, Twitter, 
uh, LinkedIn. But this is all about you, my friend. We want to learn more about you. No, I know, I know, I know. But hey, people, this guy was actually shot at by surface-to-air missiles in a fighter jet. Like this guy makes Tom Cruise look like chicken shit. So uh, check him out. He's an amazing dude. Now, Les, there's there's nothing worse than cutting off <laughs> the the main person in the middle of a speech um, during a live feed. This is the first time we've ever done this, people, and you are witnessing history. So um, little things are going to happen. But have we got you back, my brother? Yes, it's it's a pleasure to be back. I we just had some technical difficulties, and and but that's representative of life. That when you're doing something, there are going to be interruptions, and and we're going through a, a time of of major disrupt disruptions all over the world. And what we have to do is focus on them and deal with them and turn them around for our advantage. So. I'm back. So what would you like to ask me, please? Let's start. Take it from the top and I'm ready. Well, I think what, what might be fun, Les, is uh, maybe like a bit of a Q&A with, between you and I okay. with regards okay. to... When the option to, stops trading, this is typically going to be the third Friday of each month. For... Oh. We still got you, Les? I'm still here. So, yeah, why don't we... Uh, if, if someone has a, a question, we can throw it to the audience that, that they want us to. Other contracts called weekly options that may expire each and every Friday. I don't know who that is, but they need to sort their Zoom etiquette out ASAP. <laughs> right. Do we have any questions from the audience that they can ask either Les or myself? How about we start with that? Now, I can only see like, 30 of you jokers at a time. So if we, if we got my, my amazing team that are here today. And just while we're doing this, huge, this round is <laughs> huge <laughs> shout out. Now you're muted, Laban. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's the, that's the guy without the shirt. <laughs> How are we going, right. darling? Just come back and cash in, in everyone. everyone. Bill, Bill, you 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 okay, that's better. My apologies. So, massive shout out to my darling Anna, who's sitting next to me on my right, who is battling, not feeling great, done an amazing job. Put some put some congratulations or some hands together in the chat. Uh, my amazing admin team comprised of Bell and Krishna who are on the chat who have been working tirelessly in the background. Uh, Emily Blanche, who's helping me facilitate this as well. And, you know, an event like this that was put together really at, at pretty short notice for those who have ever launched a book before, uh, there was some miscommunication with regards to the, the, the book launch and just a, a, a few other things, some challenges, but the opportunities that it's presented have been remarkable and, and, and people have bandied around in a way that is just remarkable, like, and, and sharing the, the invite and to have, you know, 100 uh, plus people turn up to a, a complete stranger in many cases. Many of you haven't had an opportunity to meet me in person yet to this book launch, I can't express my gratitude enough. But so have we been able to, have we got a hand up or someone waving around that we can ask, we can unmute and they can ask Les or myself a question? So I'll jump in. Loon had a question um, and I guess both Les and you, Laban, could answer this one. Um, how do you keep the motivation level up each and every day? You go, Les. I think it's very important that, Life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go well, and sometimes they don't go well. And they impact you. But what's important now is selecting and doing something that's you. That's very important. Because when the difficulties come, when the challenges happen, when the failures show up, and you experience a lot of rejection or losses, that if you're doing the work that you are supposed to do, that it's your calling, a job is what you get paid for, a calling is what you are made for, 
that you know that you will fail your way to success and that giving up, stopping is not an option, that you continue to move forward and look for ways to pull it out. Don't stop. Don't stand around and complain about what's happening to you. There's never been a statue erected to a critic. Continue to move forward. Even a broke clock is right twice a day. Keep on swinging, keep on moving, and you'll eventually have a breakthrough. Just bet on you. Oh, behave. <laughs> Les, we didn't even coordinate this this red color. I've been wearing my pink jacket nonstop, and I thought, you know what? Today feels like a red jacket kind of day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, red is my favorite color because it's a color of power, and we're living in the attention economy. And so whatever you do, you have to find ways to call attention to yourself. And part of that is being so good at what you do that people can't ignore you but also they see you before they hear you. So you have to dress for impact. <laughs> Amen, brother. I, I know we've got three participants. I know there's some people here, Les, that, that, that are huge fans of uh, you and your work, that this is an opportunity. And I, I can see Joe Perone's got his hand up here. And uh, Joe, what do you got to ask Les or myself? Probably Les Saban, first of all, congratulations, man. You, you've you've done a great job on this and and bringing all these great people together, a bunch of givers. And Les Brown, love you, man. Um, just a big fan of your work. And Laban, you've taken Les's message of you got to be hungry. Les, can you give us a you got to be hungry one time? You got to be hungry. Yeah, baby. <laughs> baby, you, you brought that one to life and you were, you were hungry to get this message out and get it out in a, in a very timely fashion. Nothing was holding you back. I know you faced some challenges. We don't want to hear about the challenges. What were the pleasant surprises that you found along this, this path? Well, I never envisioned my being in this place where I am right now. It's what I realized and what has surprised me that we don't know enough about ourselves to doubt ourselves, that we must be risk takers. There's a reason that my favorite book says, walk by faith and not by sight. We must be risk takers. Biscott said, if you're not willing to risk, you can't grow. And if you can't grow, you can't become your best. And if you can't become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? And what I found that we are stronger than we give ourselves credit for being. And that many times we underestimate ourselves. I'm thinking about Lion King. Simba, you're more than that which you have become. And so what I was willing to do, I was willing to fail my way to success. I was willing to challenge myself. And I'm still doing that at 77. I'm still working on creating the next greatest version of myself. I'm not through yet. I will not be home looking at Netflix. I'll be creating my own movie along with my brother, Laban. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Laban and, and uh, Les, rather. And Laban, tell us some of these pleasant surprises. You built a, you built a great community, brother, and I love you, and I'm so proud of you, bro. Well, I love you, John, and, and you know, a massive shout out to Joe. He's responsible for many other people in this Zoom today being in my life um, and that have helped me on this trajectory of taking this motherfucker supernova. And if you'll excuse the French, that's the only way to give this credit for the impact that this book is going to have on the world. And, and I didn't write this with the intent of, of selling 5,000 or 10,000 copies. I want a copy of this in every single library and, and hand of every single person on the planet that wants help, that wants help. And that's the catalyst. We've got to want help. And, and to answer your question, Joe, there's been so many beautiful unintended uh, byproducts and consequences and, and blessings from writing this book, but, but learning about myself and learning how to stop trying to help those that do not want help. We expend so much energy on people that do not want the help that they so desperately need. At least we have in our own mind. 
And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that actually want help and they're the people that we should be directing our efforts and our attention to and, and you know, just leading by example as best we can and uh, that's, that's just what comes to mind, Joe. So thank you for the question a lot. We got a watch party here in Mesa, Labor. We, we, we got, we got a, come over here, we can get you in, Alan. So my so, Australian brother from down under. So, so Labor, man, this isn't a question, just a, a comment. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it, Steve. Steve Hardison, okay, so, everybody. Uh, first of all, this this is ABC here: the Aussie, the Bacon, and the cheerleader. <laughs> and and we're for you. We're here for you. So. I'm the, here's why I'm the cheerleader. <laughs> what I know about you, Laban, in the very short period of time is you are the distinction that I create with people. It's called like betting on last year's Super Bowl. I'm not a betting man, but if I could bet on last year's Super Bowl, I'd go leverage everything I could get. And I know that's who you are. I watched you in a communication with another person, with Dale, how you helped so quickly. And your book, Bet On You, Acronym BOY, bet on you. Boy, boy, boy. What a great thing you've done. Les, thanks for who you are in the world. We're the three of us in this casita. We don't have a question. We have a statement. Bet on you. You're like betting on last year's Super Bowl. And I love what Les said. To be able to say, this is the you you want to see. Who's this? Count on this. This is the best wingman. This is the best wingman. And, of course, Chris Doris is the best wingman, too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're letting us support you. The Ledger! Ledger! <laughs> oh, you guys are too much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, less. Hopefully, the Steve's book arrived uh, yesterday or today. I think there will be an opportunity to read it, and and we can talk about this another time. But um, Krishna or. Uh, Bell, if we could get a copy of uh, Steve's book in there as well, that'd be awesome. I know he, he he doesn't want me to do that, but I I want I want to to make that available to other people. Um, we have a question from Ashley. Ashley, you got a question from your son? Can we? Why uh, do you want? Why do you? Why do you want to make more money? Oh, I think he wanted to ask if it was important to make lots of money. What's your name, young man? What's your name, young man? Isaiah. 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 What a Isaiah. great, strong Isaiah. biblical name. So, so my, my kids yesterday in the car were coming up with business plans and asked whether at that age they could help change the world by coming up with solutions to people's problems. Yeah. But we're, we got five Five, five, four, and six. What a great oh, question. Isaiah. What a great what question, a great Isaiah. Question. And what a great question, Isaiah. And you might need to turn down the, the volume a little bit, but I'll fucking answer the question. Isaiah, it's really important to attain financial freedom doing what you love because if you can create all the abundance that you'll ever need, then you can stay in the creation zone and you can impact far more people if you're not worried about whether you've got to pay the power bill or your rent or the car payment or worried about where the next meal is going to come from. And I, I certainly don't think we should be given abundance. I think we should work for it. We need to work for it. And I think if you want to create impact in the world, you want to change the lives of millions and billions of people, if you can have what we call FU money, FU money, so that at any point the government, the country, armies, you've got the financial resources to excommunicate yourself from there to solve as many problems. Money will solve many, many problems. If you can do it through creation and, and changing lives in a positive manner, then that's, that's my recommendation. Great question. Thank you. Donata. What do we got next? Who's next on our – who else had their hand up? Maybe jump over to Susan. 
we'll just hit Susan. the list of all the raised hands. So yes, yeah, Susan, go for it. Hey, um, I, I'm going to make everybody out there jealous because Laban just moved onto my street. We are, this is my neighbor. And, and I will tell you, him and Anna have added such a dynamic, amazing energy. And we are so blessed to, uh, to be in your orbit. And to, I, I kind of imagine him like with the cape swooping behind you and the energy that's that's created by Laban in his it, it's not awake because it doesn't rock you it's a it's a it's a it's an energy that picks you up and wants you to to fly with him and so i'm super excited uh, that you're launching this book i'm super excited that you've just moved into uh, our community here in Playa del Carmen Mexico and uh, i wanted to just ask a question of both you and Les because I love Les Brown. Les, it's a privilege to be talking to you today. Um, I just listened to you on a YouTube video and you said something that just really stood out to me. And I want to put this in front of both you and Laban. But you said that, um, and I thought it was really powerful. You said, things are not here to stay. Things are here to pass. And, and I think in those moments when we're wanting things to pass, and I think with COVID, we're dealing with that and just sickness and just the, the, the way of the world. I would love some specific tips from the two of you about when I'm in those moments, just waiting for something to pass, uh, how do I bet on myself? And how do I encourage my children to bet on themselves and my husband and my community? Well, let, let, me, let me take a swing at that. First of all, thank you very much, Susan, for being a part of this community with my very good friend, my brother from another mother. <laughs> I would show you my tan chest, but you can't handle it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> this is but, me with a tropical tan. <laughs> yes, okay. But, but what's important during the time that you're going through some stuff, understand and know, keep your faith in your faith. Faith not tested can be trusted. Many things that happen to us, they happen for us to learn how to navigate it, how to grow. Were it not for the resistance of air, an airplane couldn't fly. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, 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 the battles and the challenges that we face in life, they strengthen us. We find a way to win. We grow mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And we rise to the occasion. But a lot of people who are full of give up, they stop. But you, the reason that you're part of this community, that you don't have that give up spirit in you. You have a spirit of courage. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and of power and of sound mind. And so continue to focus on your goals and dream. Stay active and, and, and change your approach. But don't change your goal of what it is that you want to do because resistance rejections and failures it's a part of the process that's why people say when you're an entrepreneur it's lonely at the top yes it is but you eat better <laughs> i don't know if you need me to answer that any further susan what do you reckon <laughs> I don't know. It's awesome. Like, I'm sure you're going to add to this conversation for much time to come. So I'm super excited that you're so accessible. I get to see Laban in person and his, his, his beautiful partner, Anna. So I'm a lucky girl. Well, look, and just a massive shout out to Susan and, and uh, like how welcoming you have been and, and just allowing us into your home. And, and, you know, we've just, we've come there. We don't really know anyone. And, and, when we had a party at your place the other day with like 60, 70 people on there. And it was the first time we hung out with 60, 70 people for a long, long, long time, you know, so we're very grateful and uh, your darling husband as well. So who I think is on board. Uh, we got a, we got a question coming from Christian Van Day. Hey Laban, thanks for having me today. Absolute pleasure to see you guys and everyone here today. Um, I guess I just want to go back maybe half a step, and I'd love to hear from Les on this one in particular, and, of course, you, Laban. Um, but we talk about having this uh, courage to follow your dreams and your have a mission and uh, find your purpose. If someone's a blank canvas and, they, and they're sort of half a step behind, and how do you um, help people or do you have any tips to help people discover their purpose? Like if they feel like, you know, 
like they're ready to launch into something, but they just don't know what it is. Any tips or any advice you can give someone who's sort of ready to go, they're ready to give, but they're not quite sure exactly what, what they've gotten and, and what they have to offer. I'd love to hear your insights on that question. I'm glad you asked that question. They do know. And you got to ask questions that will bring it out of them. Let me ask you a question. What is one thing as you look at your life, look at your goals and look at what it is you want to do with your life that drives you? I think for me, it's really about looking after family mm -hmm. and um, living the most sober life possible for me personally. But, um, but it's, yeah, it's really about family. Above and beyond that, how would you do that? Um, I think it's about living as an example more than anything. Yes. Now, I want yeah. you, I'm going to ask you that question again, and I want you to say, I don't know. So tell me, what is it that you would like to do with your life that you're not doing right now? I don't know. Well, okay. You don't know. But if you did know, what would that look like? I want you to speak from your imagination. We're taught that I'll give you all your eyes can see. What if you did know, had some idea of doing something that you can do 24-7 because it's you, it's something that gives your life a sense of significance. It's something that you love so much that you do it for nothing, but you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. What is it? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It's not a yeah, million dollar question. Absolutely. You know what it is. So tell me what it is. I'm struggling. I don't, well, I don't you know. You don't have to I, struggle. Who are we going to talk to? Your neighbors? There's no struggle in this. This is you. You were mm. created on purpose for a purpose. The reason you're here is because the world would be incomplete without you. Adam, where are you? That question, when God asked Adam, where are you? It was not a location question. God is omnipresent and omniscient, all-knowing and all-knowledge. It, it, it was a question of where are you in terms of all that you have going for you, you made in my likeness and image. You've been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth. Where are you? What are you doing with the power, authority, and dominion that I have given you? Powerful questions. Powerful questions. I still yeah, don't know the answer. But, answer. You know. Give me a powerful <laughs> answer. Because life is a question. And how you live your life is the answer. And you have the mm. choice to choose something that you will start with. And once you start, if you're going in the right direction, good. If you're going in the wrong direction, turn around and you'll know you're going in the right direction. Okay. Okay. Well, that's very helpful, that last bit, especially. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry to get into your grill like that. You asked for it. That's okay. What you asked for, because you <laughs> might just get it. Oh, behave. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Laban. Christian, yeah, you're right. He, Les, he asked for it, and you gave it to him, and I know you're going to have some mm -hmm. pondering after this chat. So I ain't playing with you. Don't come up in here unless you're ready, darling. <laughs> 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 All right. Next person on the list is my darling mother. G'day, mum. Can we unmute? Yep. Is it better? There we go. We got you. Yep. Okay. Christian, you're a radio announcer. Surely you want to further that. That's part of your calling. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, Liz, stand up, please. Liz, where is he? Here I am. Stand up. Yeah. I love it. I wanted to see what was on your T-shirt. All I could see was not old. I'm a classic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to own that because I'm not, I'm about 10 years younger than you. No, not quite. About eight years younger than you. So I love that. That's so cool. You're awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. M-I-C, see you real soon. K-E-Y-Y, -Y, because we like you. M-O-U-S-E, <laughs> Mickey Mouse. I'm a Mickey Mouse fan. 
<laughs> yeah, I love it. That was so cool. Anyway, that's really all I had to say. Um, Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack Muir, let's get you on the let's get you on the call. Oh, can we? You still muted, brother? Unmute. Yeah, go for it now, brother. Go, Jack. Yeah, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, thanks to which it's been a lovely um, book launch. I really enjoyed it. Um, got a question for uh, probably all three, uh, probably Liz, Deutsch, uh, and uh, Waldo, if you, if you wanted to answer it. Where were you on September the 11th, 2001? What did you go through and how did that change your uh, journey in life and, and how you approach life from that moment? Thanks. I was at home on September the 11th. And it was a sobering moment. And what I realized then and do now during this pandemic, that life is fragile and life has no duplicate. And that we owe it to ourselves and for the people who've made sacrifices so that we can enjoy certain freedom, so we can go to sleep and good, get a good night's sleep and feel safe, to do all we can with what we have and never be satisfied, and, and working to leave a legacy, to live a life that will outlive us. So it was jarring. My, my twin brother, we, we were both adopted, uh, he spent uh, 24 years in the military, and and Wesley he he was wounded in Vietnam, and when I called him, uh, his voice was trembling, and and he suffers from PTSD, and that was a trigger for him, and I said I'm 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 coming to be with you. It was jarring, it was life changing, the what I know. We're here because of God's grace and mercy. 3,000 people got up going to work thinking they would come home to their families, and they did not. And we get to live the life that they didn't get to live and do our best to maximize it, to make a better world than what they left. And through speaking. Waldo? Thanks, Liz. Mm -hmm. Waldo? It's a great question, and uh, and Les, it's great to see you. I, I also have an identical twin brother. I don't know if you know that. It's no. uh, it's uh, he's my best friend. He's somebody that uh, I, I I always say a wingman is somebody that you unconditionally can call out to for help, and you know that they will be there for you, and then you'll be there for him. And we have to talk about that more because it's 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 really huge. So I was living in Orlando at the time. I decided to get out of active duty just a year prior. Um, actually, maybe six six months prior, I was in defense contracting, working in sales. Uh, I joined the reserve, and when I saw the planes hit the, uh, the the twin towers, you know, the first thing that went through my mind was, you know, I'm wondering if I'm going to get called back into active duty to fly in combat. I'd been in Iraq. I'd, I'd flown many missions in the Middle East. I had the experience, and I was wondering if it was going to be time for me to join up. And I thought about my brothers and sisters in arms who were going to be likely fighting that enemy who tried to take away our freedom. And I also thought about the incumbent responsibility that we have as free citizens of this country, not just as Americans, but as Australians, as Brits, as French, all our allied partners who fight uh, those who try to take away the blessings of freedom. And and it's important for us to think about, we have the mini 9-11 going on every day with COVID. If you've woken up and had uh, a phone call and they said your tests are positive, uh, you're suffering with a, a, a divorce or cancer or something, every combat mission, every day potentially is a challenge for you to come into yourself and find that what I call meaning to your mission. And when you look at what's going on in the world today, when you think about your responsibility, not just your blessing, not just your gift, but your responsibility, which I believe trumps passion. 
when you think about those people that need you, that that you love unconditionally, that you'll fly a combat mission for no matter what, that you will put your life on the line, that is where you're going to find your gift. That is where you're going to find your ability to face your fears. And 9-11, COVID, the challenges that we have in our day, whatever they are, force you to double down on your responsibility. And when you combine that with passion, then you'll be able to fight, face the Ob Osama bin Laden's, the enemy from within COVID and all the fears that, that keep us in the hangar of doubt, paralyzed to take action. I call it either, either missing an action, MIA, or your MIH making it happen, airborne, flying, potentially getting your ass shot at, but that's where life is. And uh, that's what heroes do every single day. And I have a feeling that's exactly what the book uh, Bet On You is all about, Laban. And that's, I know, what is at the core of guys like Les Brown and probably many of the people who are listening and participating in this amazing tribute to an amazing book and uh, all the people that are going to be impacted by it. Thanks, Waldo. Beautifully said, Waldo. Uh, I was working at Vodafone in Christchurch, <laughs> and I was on about 17 bucks an hour, and I remember skiving off the whole day because I was working in a shopping centre in Hornby and in Christchurch there in New Zealand, and, and, I, and I absconded from my duties selling mobile phones that day because there was a feed on the news, and they were just showing the footage the plane's going into the building and, and, uh, and I'll never forget it for as long as I live. And, and, and when I wrote and put that in the book, it was really important that I didn't, didn't use that experience lightly or in jest. It was a serious, serious moment and because uh, of the impact it had on me. And, and that's why I wanted to use it for that real life experience when I lost the money uh, in the casino. Uh, how it changed my life, I think, that was my first major experience in, in, you know, this could happen to us. You see so much stuff far, you know, the other side of the planet. And, uh, but this was in our own backyard, even though it was in the U S so it made it a lot more real. Thanks, George. No worries, brother. Doreen Downing, you've been waiting so patiently. Oh, well, I've been waiting patiently for this day ever since uh, you and I had that first conversation. Wow, what a, a massive amount of treasures, nuggets here today. And I hope this is going to be videoed so we can all go back and uh, uh, take it in again. Les, I'm Doreen. And if you watched Mickey Mouse, she was one of the original Mickey Mouse in the club, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I am thinking about uh, with both of you having had, you know, major challenges, addictions, uh, depression, uh, gambling, and really getting very, very far away from the core spirit that we find and we get to experience today <laughs> with you. And so my sense and that's uh, probably true. Well, it's not probably. It's true for all of us. We have an essence. And so when you, Laban, <laughs> you're so dear. And you, Les, I don't know you, but I'm falling in love with you too. When you were born in that moment, it was like, here's, here's this bright spirit. And somewhere along the line, there was a twist or something that society just didn't let you, you know, come out of the, <laughs> the egg and just really plant yourself like you guys are doing today. And I guess, first of all, I just want to say, I believe that that spirit that was inside of you from the very beginning is what, like Les, you said, Everything that goes on in life is what teaches you. So all those kinds of tragedies are part of what makes you who you are. And isn't that amazing that, you know, you have this beautiful core bright spirit that, that you come from love and yet you suffered. And so I, I guess I'm trying to find my question here, but first just to honor both of you for your, your giving in the way that you have given to us, not only today, but with your whole life and using, I guess, I guess maybe it's just about using your story. That feels like what the message to me I'm taking today 
one of them, (laughs) using your story, your pain, your suffering to um, to learn and then be able to turn it around like you guys are doing today, giving your lessons back to us. So I think I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> All right. And, and, you know, that's you're making a very good point. One of the reasons I told Laban to, to, to write his book is because the millions of people are suffering from broken hearts, empty pockets, and, and just lives have been devastated with what's going on right now. Uh, and Steve Jobs said the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. I train speakers and and in my coaching, what I, I share with people that when you tell your story, what we do and what's most important and what gave me a breakthrough, my, consider me, you know, here I am, 77, I'm still doing it. I was born in an abandoned building in a poor section of Miami, Florida, in, an, in a, a, a building on a floor with my twin brother. And we were taken in as foster kids. When I was in the fifth grade, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I failed again when I was in the eighth grade. And I had this high school teacher who was very much like Aben. He said, young man, I want you to work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, do it anyhow. I said, sir, I'm not your student. He said, I said, do it anyhow. Then the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And they uh-huh. ask him, are you going to make him do that? And he asked me, what is DT? I said, they call me the dumb twin. Mm-hmm. And, and I am. And he came from behind his desk. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Do you hear me? And what he did was he interrupted my vision of myself. This book, Bet on You. There are a lot of people that are fearful right now, a lot of people that are giving up, a lot of people are living a life that's not them. And what Laban is saying, bet on you. You have abilities that you haven't even reached for yet. Bet on you. As you look at yourself, look at your goals, focus on what value can I bring? What is it that I'm supposed to do? Take the time to get to know you and do you. Bet on you and make your mark in the world. Yeah. That's my story, and I'm sticking, I'm sticking to, to it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, Les. Does that answer your, your, your statement, Doreen? It's a, it's a response. I guess that's all I was looking for and open to anything that came back. And Laban, thank you. Thank you, Doreen. You're a wonderful human being. Dr. Bridget Cooper. Uh, how do I even follow Doreen? I don't even know how to do that. That just seems like what an honor. So it's an honor to, to be on the call and to have just met you, Laban, and to have never have met you, but feel like now I know you better less. So thank you for your words. And what I loved about what you just said, and it totally teed up my question, was that, you know, you know, um, Laban, in some of our conversation that what I talk about is contracts, that we sign these contracts about who we are and and what we are meant for early on before we have a chance to really challenge those ideas. And I heard in your statements, um, Les, that maybe your contract was that I'm the DT, right? That this is this is who I am. This is what I meant for. And that was your old contract. And you had to write a new one in order to jettison you out of where you were, you know, to bring you to be the, you know, amazing person, you know, the powerful, um, powerful voice you are in the world today. And Laban, you're kicking this off. Tell, I, I hear the new contract is that I bet on me. I'm the world's, you know, greatest courage coach. You know, that's my new contract. What was the old contract that you were living by? Because I think that will help kind of people who are listening and thinking about your book to understand how you shift that. What was that old contract that you were telling yourself before that got you into all those dark places? Wow, what a <laughs> an amazing question. The the only thing that really immediately comes to mind is is the opposite of where I am now, where I sure. was like I've endured all of this dysfunction and trauma and this is my bit, you know, I'm going to 
I'm just going to struggle. I'm going to be the victim and I'm going to wallow in my self pity. And, you know, that's going to be my bit. And, yeah. uh, and now I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> I'm like, let me, let me reclaim that. And we got Vanessa Brewers here who's the world's best reclamation coach. And I'm reclaiming my power because when, when I get my power back, people can't hold it against me anymore. And that's what I want right. to, that's what I want to make very clear in the book that, that whatever we have gone through in our life, whatever adversities, whatever shit storm we've encountered is now our superpower. And that's what that conversation with Les, you sparked that, that inside me and allowed me to run with something so dramatic, you know, in addition to the thousands of hours of work I've done on myself. Yeah, I think you you just stated the two most powerful words that a person can say about their old story and their old contracts is fuck that. So thank you for saying <laughs> fuck that and sharing that with the rest of us. Congratulations on your book. You know I just, Hold it a minute. I got the whole, no. We just saw a little boy that's watching. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Liz, oh. we could have. We should have put the R18 in the, uh, in the yeah, chair. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things I, I, I train and teach my speakers, hey, we got to be mindful of what we say and how we say it. That speaking yeah. is about transforming lives, distract, dispute, and inspire. How people live right. their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. And what we have to do right. in our languaging approach is have an approach that we can impact everybody, those on the bottom, those at top, those that are older, and those that are younger. Our kids are watching us. They're watching and they're listening to us. And so I teach kids that profanity is the strongest expression of a weak mind. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I teach them that is because they, they listen to a lot of this rap music and I say, what you listen to, you turn into. And so you want to be mindful of how you carry yourself if you want to represent yourself so that people can see you as a force for good. And so when I'm training and working with them, I teach them to transform their mindset, to, to clean up their, their, their language, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. I teach them how to dress like a prospect rather than a suspect. And, and, and teach them how to develop collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. And so they're watching us. When I was a kid, the, the way you determine an adult from a child is the access to information that they have. That's no longer true. When I was a kid, we had ABC, we had NBC, <laughs> and CBS, Laven. That was it, <laughs> okay? These kids now... They had they see everything and they're exposed to it before their minds develop. And what we do, they will do. What we say, they will say. And so we have to be mindful. I mean, this this th th this place where we are right now, the suicide rate among our kids has mm. increased dramatically. And, and there are some experiences that Laban shares in Bet On You that's going to be beneficial because what he's saying to them, what you're going through, I've been through. Hmm. Bet on you. I am exhibit A that you can get through this and live a life of meaning and purpose because I stepped out of line. I decided not to follow the crowd. I decided that I was going to be different. you got to hold yourself to a higher standard. And he has an ability, he's a great communicator, to speak from his heart, to reach them as well as their parents. I'm through speaking, baby. <laughs> well, I can cross getting told off by Les Brown off my 2021 oh, I bucket list. You off. I'm just, I just... <laughs> I wouldn't say anything had I not seen that little boy. He's still probably watching. Well, it's Liz. I'm it's sure a, he's not the only one. No, well, he's I, definitely I, not. I apologize. I'm, I apologize. Y'all no. just go ahead and say all the things y'all want to say. I will be praying for you. <laughs> I will. I will reframe it as F that. How's that? Or forget that. But it's it's 
But I, but I applaud you, Laban, for being able to say whether it's profane or not, whichever vernacular you're using, that I'm going to leave that version of myself in the past. And I think that's the powerful message of bet on you is that you're saying, I'm going to tell you all about that version of myself and how I told myself all the stories to tell all these stories. And now with bet on you, I'm going to tell a new set of stories because I'm going to leave those in the past. And I love that. I love that message. So, and thank you for all those words last, because that's a, also a very powerful message to try to build up um, our youth that really need to, to learn how to do that mm-hmm. for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Dr. Thank Bay. And being open to that. Well, I, I'm going to, I have to read if, if it's going to impede my ability to, to get that communication through to the, the person at the receiving end, if, if I need to, to dial back the the profanity, then then that's what I got to do. I want to create the most amount of impact in the shortest amount of time. And if I've got to to, to knock those curse words out, then so be it. You know. Um, Thank you for being coachable because what I teach and 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 train speakers never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience wants to hear. All right. And so we have to we have audiences inside of each audience. And to create that committed listening and to create an experience that will transform that audience individually and collectively, we have to speak in a way that everybody can hear it and not get hung up when we say something that's out of line with in their regular conversation. I know Pruitt, I, I use profanity as well, as well, but I select the place in which I use it and I never do it in, in, in when I'm giving a speech. But the uh, my, my, I have a son that's going through something right now. Uh, he's bipolar schizophrenic. And, and I said to him recently, you about to make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. You about to make me act a fool up in here, up in here. And, and, and through the conviction of which I spoke, he knew that I meant business that he had to be responsible for the choices that he makes. We make decisions and our decisions make us. And I'm not going to give you a pass saying, oh, well, you know, that wasn't me. That was a disease speaking. No, no, no. We had an agreement. We had a contract. You take your medication, you can live a normal life. If you don't, you got to get out of here. I'm going to hold you responsible for your behavior, for your choices. This is serious times where we are right now. Hey, Laban, can I say something real quick? Sure, Walter, yeah. Yeah, and, and I so agree with what Les says, and somebody's on, on the platform a lot. You know, I think a lot of folks who use language curses, and I'll, I'll occasionally drop a, a shit bomb or whatever uh, on stage, but it's... <laughs> it's uh, and, and the kids yeah. said that they were gone. They said the kids were gone, but it's about being authentically you. And I'd rather somebody curse on stage and risk risk alienating some to get the loyalty and passion of others and belief. Sometimes you have to go there. It's hard not to do it, but you need more skills. You need more discipline. Uh, I, I know there are a lot of great speakers out there who use, who drop a lot of F-bombs and a lot of curses. And I think it's sloppy and it's easy to do it's harder not to say the curse words and still come across as passionate and authentic but i do respect a speaker once in a while who has the passion and drive and is willing to risk being absolutely authentically themselves if by dropping a curse word they do that but not just because it's easy uh to do, you know what I mean? And I think the reason why I like you and the reason why everybody's not technically offended by you using a curse word and being pretty graphic is it's authentically you and we need that more than ever today. Uh, I'd rather see that than plasticity and and, uh, a veneer that hides your true authentic self. So that's just a couple words on that. Yeah, first of all, I I take issue with you. First, Laban and I, we are very close. I love him and I believe in what he's saying. Profanity don't change people. Stories do. Stories. When you can tell a story and create an experience, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes says that once a, a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, 
It can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. And, and going there to me, and when I listened to, to Laban and he told me his story, he never cursed. Am I right, Laban? You never used any profanity, but it was Amen. so gripping. We spent time together over an hour and it was compelling. It touched me. I do a lot of interviews with a lot of people, but I have not developed a relationship with them as I developed with him because how transpar uh, transparent he was. I read a book once called Why well, I'm Afraid to Tell You Who I Am, because you might not like me. And that's all I've got. And what Laban did was he shared with me his heart. That's the power, not the F-bomb. He shared with me what he experienced. And what he was saying is, that's what I did, did, but that's not who I am. And I'm saying to you, there are people that works for them, and that's fine. They can do the F-bomb and everything else up in here, up in here. I just saw that little boy. I, I apologize for saying anything. Y'all can go ahead on and, and do it all you want. I'm just here for my friend because I love him so much, honey. And I told him, you you keep on showing that, that chest, you're going to have to put a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, oh Paul. Thanks, Liz. We we got time for a couple more questions. I think Loon, you've been waiting patiently. Hey, Lavan, how are you doing? I got how a you lot better? of enemies now, Levin. I got a lot of enemies. Right I now. doubt that. I doubt hey. that, Liz. What do you got for us, Loon? Hey, Lavan. How are you going? So I'm starting to question my listening skill because we've been. You former neighbors for almost two years, I think 2019, 2020, been through pre-COVID and during COVID with you and Anna living in the same building <laughs> in Melbourne, Australia. Good to see the both of you again. And now, now I'm starting to question my listening skill because I got introduced to you as Laban and now everyone's calling you Laban. It's like, am I having a listening problem for the last <laughs> three years? <laughs> No, you've just got a neighbour who didn't set clear enough boundaries about the correct pronunciation of his name and just let it slide. Yep. It's the European version that you're going with, the Laban. So, but technically, my given <laughs> anyway. name is Laban. But uh, as long as you don't call me late for dinner, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's been definitely a good pleasure and get, living next door to you guys. You know, when I first met Laban, you, I got introduced to you. And my wife and I just think like, all right, there's only three words can describe both you and Anna. So it's just pretty much courage, self-discipline, and determination. And my wife just said, why do you choose these three words? I just say, in cold Melbourne weather, Laban can still go out to do his routine of jogging and running shitless. And this is something I just say, no way, I can't do it. It's just too crazy to do it. And you still do it. So this is what I really admire about your attitude and your perspective in life is like when you set your goal to do something you just do it regardless of what coming your way whether any obstructions weather or nature whatever it is this is what we learn and also you're a really open-minded person we talk about a lot of things and a lot of shit as well especially when it happens to go into the same leaf when we're going in and out and you always and i ask you the questions as well it's like oh how do you keep yourself motivated is it that the diet or your emotional or how you present. And this is where Laban introduced me to that. Just eat more meat. Go for a carnival diet. I just say, being an Asian person, usually eating more meat doesn't synchronize in our culture. It's just like, it's more carb-based, not meat-based. So this is where we try it. Unfortunately, it did not work for us. We just feel too heavy there. But I'm glad it works for you. And congratulations again on the new book. I'm happy to join you here in morning in Melbourne, Australia as well. <laughs> thank you, Loon. We appreciate you joining and thank you for your kind, beautiful words. Uh, it was lovely having you guys as neighbours. We got another question. Uh, Niall, is Niall clerk in there? You there, brother? And if he's not, then let's go with Josh. Josh Ditchburn. Yes, he's my brother. Hello. You got me? Hello. Can you hear me? Ten four. Hey, mate. Uh, look, just want to say congratulations on this um, historic moment for our family. I think only one other person has either written a book, but I don't think it was ever published, uh, our grandfather, uh, Papa Dean. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, brilliant, Liz. Um, I love you, and I've never met you. I don't think we've ever spoken. Um, but I did do the uh, editing 
in the early days for the Become Your Own Superhero podcast. And I watched the unedited version of the interchange between you and Laban. And um, it, it was a truly um, spiritual moment. And to some degree, it's like a, I don't know, it seemed like a blessing that came over this whole thing. And, um, and I knew uh, regardless of what the outcome was, our lives would be changed forever. Um, and I think the great thing about this book will be, uh, you know, the ability to, and I, I haven't actually read it. I, the only thing I've heard is, um, the two queen story twice. <laughs> and the second time it was still brilliant. Um, so I'm really, uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to, um, uh, read it because I, I'm not a huge reader or if I'm going to listen to the audio book, um, and, and listen to my brother talk to me for 12 hours or <laughs> Is, uh, while I'm driving around. But um, I think the biggest thing about this whole thing is, and, and I'm, I'm still on a journey myself, and apparently I'm, I'm in the book somewhere, which is kind of exciting. I'm, I'm interested to see what it's written about me, hopefully all positive. But, uh, you know, we're all on a bit of a journey, and I think if we can all as human beings uh, help each other out at certain points, will be much better off. And, and no one's always up, you know. Um, and if they are, their, their drugs are probably you know, up to, but, uh, you, you know, we can't, we go down and we go up. And I think the most important thing, and, and I've noticed around my friends and, and the inspiration that Laban's given me and, and somehow I've given him back and, and, and the circle of people that get involved, I think, you know, by proxy, we're all helping each other out. And I think that's the most important part. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been able to help my friends and then when I'm low, they, they pick me up. And I think this book might be a tool for that. Um, and at least a starting point or a, a signpost pointing to where we're, we're going to go. But anyway, mate, I just want to say congratulations. Um, Liz, what you touched on earlier and the interchange was actually kind of brilliant. I think it's okay that we can uh, talk to each other and we can still disagree. I think this, this uh, world we live in where we can't agree with each other um, and, and it means we have to be enemies is, is, is kind of crazy. I love having conversations where I don't necessarily agree with that person, but we can still walk away as friends and be happy. Um, and I too have, um, my own challenges with language. My mother says to me, Gail, who you saw earlier, put your big, big boy pants on Josh and step up <laughs> as much to my dis dismay. Uh, but I have young children that, uh, love to repeat what I say too. So I've got some work on that and actually that, that helped me a lot, that interchange. So, um, you know, it gives us something all to work on and it's all a work in progress. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that Laban and, um, I can't wait to see you, mate, um, whether it's in the Mexico or in the uh, sunny state of where I am, Queensland. Oh, and here's, a, here's an artwork that I did for your book. At, yeah, we'll, <laughs> I never got that. Yeah, we're winding up. But let me say this. I, I'm so excited to be a part of this launch. I'm proud of you. And, you know, on my Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, I have over 3 million people, small numbers. But I want to interview you this week. I want to interview you tomorrow. I want to pr promote you. I want to use my name and my reputation to promote you, this book, the work that you're doing, because we're living in a time where people are feeling that they don't have what it takes. And they need to be told with a voice of experience, bet on you. You're sitting where I've been. Bet on you. You are in a place where I've gone through. Bet on you. There, there's another part of you that you don't know right now. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And, and what I love about you, the courage, the courage to, to take people to a place in themselves that they can't go by themselves, the things that you share. You, you just open up, and I was just impacted. I couldn't put it down. So I'm saying to you, if you have not gotten it yet, you're cheating yourself. Bet on you. That's the best bet that you can make. And I want to say to your mother, when she gave birth to you, she hit the jackpot. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Bye for now. <laughs> Yeah, Thank Liz. you, Liz. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for your kind words. If you got to run, you got to run. Massive round of applause for Mr. Liz Brown. Get some love in the chat for him, please.
We got time for one more question. Les, you got time for one more question? Yes. Yes, I do. Young Vanessa Brewers, what do you got to say for yourself? Hey, this question is actually for you, Laban. So the question is, it's kind of a two part. I'm picture, I'm thinking about you on that blackjack table and I'm like directing a movie scene. <laughs> and in this movie scene, I want to know two things. One is if that version of you, like if you told him that this is where you'd be now, what would he have thought? And if you could have gone and like replaced the croupier, is that how you say it? What would you have said to him? Great question. I don't know how to answer that. All I can say is that I wouldn't change a single molecule of what has happened to this point because to forfeit what is happening and crescendoing today and amongst all you beautiful people with this and hard mother flipping copy is not anything that I would change for the world right now. So I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but that's how I feel about it. Hmm. I don't know. Do you want to? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll let you answer the question how you want. That's okay. <laughs> I think I was more wanting to know, like, not, not that you would have changed it. Maybe I'm thinking about like for the, for the person who is, you know, either still thinking about taking that last bet or, you know, cause there's someone who's going to pick up that book. that's going to read your story and still going to think it can't be me. That can't happen to me. And so I think that's just my curiosity. It's like knowing that you would never change anything and that you should never change anything what would he have thought? Like if you had said, Hey man, like this is your future. I'm curious if he would have believed you, if not. And, and I guess the other thing is like, what would you have wanted him to know in that moment? Okay. Yeah. I got you now. So it's so unbelievable that I would have laughed. You, like you, you couldn't convince even with all the evidence of going forward into the future and coming back into that time, that this, this could eventuate and come about as a result of that. And I think it's you have to go through that process in order to, for, to, to allow it to become real. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's all a bit overwhelming, this whole experience and just with what's transpired today. And, uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you say to that, you know? That's a perfect answer. And Ladies I, and gentlemen. Um, Sorry, and Vanessa. You, you, that to always be true about you, and it's almost like, unbelievable. It's it is, yeah. You are. Congrats. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and everyone else. Before we wrap this up, if you've got the links to be able to get the book, if you have any troubles, to send us an email. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, Les, if you're still around. If you had to go, uh, what a what a wonderful experience. Uh, and for those that don't know, Les. You know, that, that what we just experienced is something really, truly miraculous and um, and just so magical. So um, is, is Les still here or is he shut off? He had to go. So I think I think that means that if, if anyone needs to, wants to stick around for a little bit and ask any further questions, I know there were some some people that had more that had more questions that we can we can take a few here. Sammy Skinner, I know you had your hand up at one point. Hey, Ditchie, uh, very entertaining read and uh, proud, of, proud of you for saying it and then doing it. And it was, uh, it was an incredible moment to, to get the book and, and see, it, see it in hard copy. My question was going to be, with a minute to go uh, previously, what's next? What's next? Well, that's a great question, Sammy. And uh, the honest answer is there's another book that's being written. I uh, haven't, haven't nailed down the title yet, but it's going to be called like Bet On You Too, like TWO or something like, you know, Look Who's Talking To or something, something along those lines. And because the book really finishes three years ago 
And if you, if you, what we wait, you think, you think this, this thing's going to be good. You wait till you read about the three years between now and then. So very, very excited. I'm planning on writing and releasing it this same date on 2022, even though I've written less than a thousand words on it. It'll, I know it'll course through me like a bolt of lightning. And, um, but, but what I would ask of, of everyone that, that is impacted by this book. And if you're not, you know, that's okay too. But if you're impacted by this book to, to give it to someone that you care about, give it to someone that, you know, will benefit from the, the rawness and, and the, 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 the vulnerability that I've just, and I'm not saying it to toot my own horn or anything, but like, it's now that it's out in the world, I can't take this back. So I have to own all this stuff now. And, uh, and I'm really proud of the man that I'm becoming. And I'm still a deeply, deeply flawed individual. And that's not negative self-talk. That's just the reality of, of who we are as human beings. And, uh, and I'm so honored to be able to share this amazing moment with you. And there's so many people that I need to thank that I just I can't do it. And uh, on this, in this forum, you know who you are, the people that have supported the VIP books as well, the signed autographs. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to my amazing team. Thank you to my amazing mum and dad and my siblings that have all jumped on board to attend this. We've all gone through our adversity and all the other bullshit, but life's too short, you know, and this book's going to help a lot of people if we get it out there to the right people. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, mate. Great effort. Congrats, Laban. Congrats, brother. Woohoo! Congrats, well Legend. Nice one, Laban. Proud of you, Laban. I'm proud that you kept your shirt on and your jacket this whole time, Laban. Damn, oh, damn. <laughs> Try living with him, mate. He nearly wears clothes. You're lucky if he's got a pair of briefs on, mate. <laughs> And you might have seen it in the chat, the audio book. Uh, we were hoping to have been ready, but uh, such is life. It's just we were relying on Jeff Bezos, and uh, he didn't come to the party. He was too busy launching his rockets. So we'll uh, should be soon. Pretty should be should be ready soon. Hey, brother, how do we get fifty of your books in the hands of VIPs at the Ultimate Experience? Let's be a sponsor, brother. Let's talk about it, Crike. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll jump off. We'll jump on another chat, Alex. You great man. We'll we'll make something happen. Dig it. All right. Has everyone got everything in the chat? Let's save the chat. All right, guys. We're gonna. I'm gonna kill this feed now. So lots of love. Thank you for everything. See you later.